Oh, hey, I'm Julia Hull. I like my coffee black and bitter like my soul. I'm a PhD candidate studying biology and ecology. I also host What the Fuck Biology, a podcast where we look at the lesser known and underappreciated strangeness in the world around us. Let's hurry and get the business out of the way so we can get on with the show. First, thanks so much to all of you who are telling your friends, family members, and coworkers, and random people know about the show. It really helps spread the word so more people can enjoy the weirdness of the natural world. And a special thank you so much to all my pod sips. You know who you are. I definitely feel the love. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel where I post cool ass nature shit videos. There's a link in the show notes. In these couple minute long videos, I show you around my forest or wherever I happen to be and point shit out that I think is cool. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok. I'm all of those places at WTF underscore biology. I'm also on Patreon at patreon.com slash WTF biology. There you can gain access to some really cool bonus content for just a buck a month. I just recently put up secrets about each of the episodes, so some little behind the scenes sneak peek for each of the episodes that have been released so far. For $5 a month, you can get exclusive access to more cool ass nature shit videos. Today is a great show. My guest and I talk about the little hidden fungal packets inside healthy plants and what the fuck are they doing while they're in there? These cryptic poison packets, hormone pumping fungi, are called endophytes. And I study these and other plant associated fungi for my PhD. So I promise that I'm gonna get really excited. My guest today has a PhD in botany from the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. After doing a postdoc and teaching botany for a number of years, he's now back to actively researching these weird-ass critters inside plants. He also writes music for the show. So join me in welcoming Dr. Ron Decker. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for asking me. Okay, so uh, will you introduce yourself and tell us about your background and your education and what got you interested in biology? So I'm Ron Deckert. My primary interest in research is in symbioses of fungi with plants, primarily uh, mutualistic interactions. I attended the University of Guelph in Canada as an undergrad, and I got a degree in plant biology there, bachelor's, and then I went on to um, study my PhD there in plant anatomy and mycorrhizology. Um, in the lab of Larry Peterson. Great. And then how did you become interested in biology? That goes back a long ways to, I remember in grade three, getting a book on reptiles and amphibians from my teacher. And I became obsessed with all things biological and scientific, primarily biological. And like most kids, I did the dinosaur thing. But then I just kept that love that just kept growing uh, for science throughout my life. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about fungi that are hidden inside of plant, healthy plant tissue. So um, these are called endophytes. So what is a good definition for an endophyte? The general definition for endophyte is a fungus, and could be bacteria too, that live inside a plant without causing symptoms of disease. And it does that for all or part of its life cycle. Great. Um, And so the field of endophytology is really young. Um, So can you tell us a little bit about when and how endophytes were even discovered? I'm not sure about the exact um, discovery of endophytes, but it had long been known that people would find fungi inside plant tissues. And I think for a a lot of botanical history, when that happened, um, you the botanist would note it down as tissue infested with fungi or diseased. You know, mostly plant pathologists would work on plants that were diseased, and they would look for fungi and find them there, and mm-hmm. it was often a disease organism. But I don't think anybody really bothered to look at healthy tissue. Right, because I mean, why, why would you? Why would you? <laughs> and then a few people started to, to do just that and realized that, hey, there's um, you can just about sample any plant and find fungi living inside there. You know, the two that stick out in my mind are Keith Clay, who did work with grass endophytes, and George Carroll, who started off the field of conifer endophytology. 
those are two different kinds of endophytes classes as we can talk about once that started you know the basically at, at first it was just everybody was amazed hey there's these fungi living there and they don't make the plant sick right so what are they doing and you can find them and and anywhere you look and so the early years when I was getting involved with it was just like hey let's look at this plant Oh, look at all these fungi. Hey, what kind of fungi are in this plant? And they would just, uh, we we're cataloging and inventorying. Does this plant have it? Yes, it does. What are they? The, such and such and such. That was the kinds of questions we could ask, and we could do it just by culturing. So how do you culture um, an endophyte? What does that mean? Well, basically, they, it's pretty simple. We know that there are microbes, like, everywhere in the environment. So what we want to do is make sure that we're finding the ones that are from the inside of the plant. So we'll take a piece of tissue like a leaf and disinfect the surface. So we'll surface sterilize it, as we say, with bleach, ethanol, or a combination of various things. So what that does is it, it ensures that when we put that piece of tissue on a petri plate, on agar, if something grows out of it, it came from the inside of the plant. That's kind of what the early days were like. Uh, surface sterilize, plate them out, see what grows out, identify. Nice. You've been studying endophytes for about 25 years or so, right? Yep. Describe the types of questions that you could ask in those early days as like, is it there? Yes. What is it? This. So what kind of questions can we ask now with the um, advancements in technology and whatnot? Yeah, well, now it's, there's a lot more that we can ask about the roles of these endophytes because before we were just cataloging who was there who was not there and we could only do it by culturing and so one of the thing we were missing was that entire suite of microbes that were non-culturable right which is a very large proportion of microbes yes yeah, generally accepted to be the greater part right we're like 95 percent of mm. fungi are thought to be not culturable right uh, same with bacteria yeah. So how do we find those unculturable fungi now? Today we can use a molecular technique. So we can probe with molecular tools. We can find out by the sequences that we, re that we get back, we can find out what the entire community is, whether they're culturable or not. Right. So what I've done with my cottonwoods is I take their twigs, I surface sterilize them to get rid of the things that are living on the surface leaving the only things that are left in the plant, grind them up, extract the DNA, put them through the DNA sequencer, so and then filter out. Getting rid of all the plant DNA, on all the bacterial DNA, and so I'm left only with the fungal DNA. And these are the fungi that are living inside the plant. And so whether I can grow them or not, I know that they're there. Right. And that allows us to ask questions like you asked a little bit earlier, what is the role of these things? So we can take uh, a plant that is stressed by drought, say, but manages to survive. And we can say, well, what does the community within that plant look like relative to one that's not stressed? Right. Are some of those members conferring drought tolerance? We can uh, create mock communities or known communities that we use for testing, you know, especially in the bacterial endophyte field. They're identifying specific species of bacteria and what their role is in enabling a plant to withstand stress. That's a really cool thing. And we know that fungi are really good at exuding plant hormones. And so we can start to think about what kinds of hormones these fungi might be creating. Right. You know, we know that foolish seedling disease of rice, for instance, the plant hormone gibberellin was discovered was that the fungus within the plant was creating or making the hormone gibberellin, um, which caused the plant to grow more, gave more habitat to the fungus. And so that was an early indication that a fungi can produce these hormones that are functional within a plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's lots of ways to be an endophytic fungus. There's lots of plant, different plant tissues. There's lots of ways that you can be an endophyte. So in a 2009 review article, four classes or types of endophytic relationships were described. So we're just going to run through these different classes real quick. Class one are called uh, clavicipitaceous endophytes. Where does this class of fungi get its name and what plant and what plant tissues do these fungi infect? Yeah, uh, that's one of the most interesting and one of the 
the associations which received a lot of early attention and still does because these are endophytes that are associated with grasses. They're characterized by being uh, the fungus being totally dependent upon the plant, so it does not have any life outside of the plant host. Because it doesn't at any point live outside the plant host, it is ne of necessity must protect the plant. Because if the plant goes, the plant is eaten, mm -hmm. the fungus is eaten. Right. So it's the success of the fungus is totally tied to the success of its host. So what that leads to, the result it leads to, is that this has become a mutualism, a combat mutualism in which the fungus defends the plant. No herbivore that has a choice will feed on a, a grass mm -hmm. like fescue mm -hmm. that has this endophyte in it because of the toxins. And they also have toxins that are directed primarily to mammalian herbivores and another suite that is directed towards insect herbivores. So the fungi are the ones that are creating these toxins that keep um, cows and deer and elk and bugs from eating their host. Right. To go back to your question, where did the name come from? It comes from Claviceps purpurea, which is, is a choke disease. The name choke comes from the fact that the fungal tissue will uh, surround the inflorescence of the grass, preventing the grass from producing. But this is a what is termed an evolutionarily unstable strategy because the, it doesn't allow its host to reproduce. Then it has no place for its children to colonize. Right. So if you take away your host, you're also taking away the place that you live. So that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's right. So because of that, um, it's evolutionarily unstable. And so the fungus has to attenuate its choking. And the more it does that, the grass has the opportunity to evolve resistance. Mm, right. Because it is a disease, a parasite. Uh-huh. So it can't allow the grass to reproduce either. Right. So what ends up happening is that the fungus gives up its ability to reproduce sexually, protects the grass, and it then in order for it to reproduce, it has to flow down through time, through the germline mm -hmm. of the host. Um, so that gets to vertical transmissions. That's where the fungus is present in the grass seed. That's right. So as soon as the fungus grows into the seed as it's forming, as, as soon as the, that seed germinates, the fungus colonizes the tissue of the developing seedling. That particular fungus is really a clone trans being transmitted through the, the germline of the plant host. It becomes more and more dependent on it over time. Right. And more and more locked into being a mutualist. Yeah, and that's kind of, that's what we see now is that the fungus is completely dependent on the plant host now. Right. And this is a this lifestyle that, you know, there's several species of, of fungi that do this and it shows like when we look at it phylogenetically that this has arisen again and again and again. It's something that's sort of inevitable. Once you start down this kind of pathway that is evolutionarily unstable, you slide down to the other end, which means you become you go from a parasite to a mutualist. Oh, that's really interesting. People that create grass seed to put in a like pasture and whatnot, they've clued into this, right? There will be growers that will certify that these um, seeds that you put in your pasture um, are endophyte free. So then your horses and your cows and stuff can eat that grass without getting sick. Right. A uh, continued diet of it over an amount of time will result in neurological damage and eventual death to a, to a cow or a horse. Or, right. Um, and so, but then on the other hand, turf grass growers have clued into it the other way and are um, offering uh, turf grass seed that is endophyte infected mm. um, so that you need to use less chemicals um, on your lawn. Nice. Okay, that's interesting that you have um, different industries that are using the same relationship for different purposes. Yeah. That's cool. Class 2 endophytes um, provide stress tolerance to their hosts. And that 2009 paper, they gave a couple of examples. So if you can you just um, explain a couple of those? Yeah, Rodriguez gives some interesting examples there, like plant that grows near yellow in i think it's yellowstone yeah near, that's right near, near hot springs and so the soil is very very hot there and a plant
plant that is infected with the endophyte curvularia protuberata is able to withstand really high temperatures up to 65 degrees, but... Celsius, right? Celsius, yes. But um, only 40 degrees C if uh, it's not infected with the endophyte. So one endophyte is, is allowing this plant to inhabit a, a habitat that it otherwise would not be able to. 65 degrees Celsius is about 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and 40 degrees Celsius is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, you wouldn't really want your bath water to be 65 degrees, I don't think. No, that would be really hot. <laughs> you would be not uh, relaxing. Yeah, so if you had an endophyte, you might find it pleasant. <laughs> right. And then there's some other examples like uh, Fusarium comorum, uh, which is found in coastal areas. Um, and it allows the plant to tolerate salinity levels that are much higher than normal. So we've got good indications that various endophytes can really change the ability of plants to live and thrive in difficult environments. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay, so when you were in grad school, you worked a little bit on class two endophytes. Um, and so this ascophyllum system is pretty what the fucky. Um, so let's talk about um, what ascophyllum is and why it's so weird. Ascophyllum is a brown alga known as knotted rack, and it's found throughout the North Atlantic on rocky coasts. It's pretty common. And my colleague, David Garbery, who's spent uh, most of his life working on this, realized that uh, it did have a fungal endophyte, and he showed that... Um, was absolutely obligate, so that if a, a young sporling of ascophyllum was not infected within the first two weeks of life, it would die. It's not clear why, um, but the interesting thing about the ascophyllum and its symbiont uh, mycophyseus is that this is like the grass, uh, similar to the grass um, symbiosis, in that the fungus occurs systemically. It, it's throughout the tissues of the of the seaweed. I was I was fortunate. He called me in to do some microscopy on it, and we found some really uh, interesting results. That the, the fungus that wraps around all the cells in the up the outer layers of the of the seaweed, and it's not it's not growing like willy nilly like you do see in the the grass endophyte symbiosis, but rather it's grows in a pattern wrapping around each cell. We still don't know what exactly it is, but um, what it's doing, but it's obviously important since uh, they just don't survive without this. That's crazy. That, I didn't realize that it's like, so right on the skin, quote unquote, of the alga, each cell is completely surrounded by fungal hyphae. Right. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it'd be really neat to find out why the algae can't live without it. What what is the fungus doing? But we don't know. Yeah, there's um, you know like some of the hypotheses are that rockweed is exposed you know twice a day by low tide, mm -hmm. so it kind of lives in that intertidal zone. Um, so the fungus may allow it to stay hydrated or functional or something during that in, uh, intertidal period when it's exposed. Hmm. It, it may have something to do with uh, anti-fouling, um, you know, to to prevent other organisms from growing on the surface of it. Oh, yeah, that makes sense, too. Because the, <laughs> the ocean is just a giant pool of, <laughs> <laughs> of things that will want to eat you. Yeah, or things that want to to sit somewhere. Right. One of the most limiting uh, things in the marine environment is space. And so if you throw a brick in the ocean, uh, come back in a couple of weeks, it'll be covered. Hmm. Like if you have to you have access to the sun to make your own food and then um, barnacles are like, hey, that's a really good place to live, you're kind of fucked. Yeah, and parasitic algae. Right. Um, which also grow on ascophyllum, uh, species of red algae. Hmm. We'll parasitize them. Huh, cool. That Yeah, that sounds like a really interesting system. 
Um, but most of your research is focused on class three endophytes. So right. what defines class three and um, what plants have these types of associations? Well, the easiest uh, where place to start is uh, your last question. Um, all plants <laughs> pretty much <laughs> have this type. So even when we're talking about the ones with class two endophytes and class one endophytes, they also have usually somewhere in the tissues class three. Mm -hmm. So class three endophytes are characterized by being uh, numerous. They're highly localized, so they may only take up a few millimeters of space. So unlike class one and class two, where you can find those uh, fungal species throughout all of the plant, you're only going to find these class threes in very small, isolated infections. Right. Yeah. So we, class one um, and some of the class twos, you know, we call them systemic because they grow, one fungus will grow throughout the plant. Mm -hmm. But a plant, class three is localized and numerous. So mm -hmm. it, it. On one plant, you may have many, many different infections. And mm -hmm. Betsy Arnold at the University of Arizona showed early on that you may, in fact, have hyperdiversity. Like in a single leaf of a tropical plant, she would find four or 500 different species of endophytes. And That's so wild. <laughs> this species um, accumulation curve was not leveling out. So there's more than she could actually right. physically find. If she sampled more, she would have found more. Yeah, that's so crazy. But that, you know, that would be like, if you imagine um, a jigsaw puzzle superimposed on the leaf, um, each of the jigsaw puzzle pieces might be a different class three endophyte infection. Wow. You know, so each of those is a different species. They may not be even closely related to each other. Right, yep. So this this allows for another type of mutualism, which we still don't know how it works, but George Carroll speculated that these endophytes could be like a library of compounds that the plant is at the plant's disposal to face um, you know, a variety of different challenges and problems. Right, right. Yeah, um, wasn't it the, um, what's it called? The something mosaic hypothesis. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the something mosaic hypothesis. Right, where you would have, um, the fungus would be making all these um, compounds that could confer protection against um, a whole suite of things that might want to eat you, and that's why the plants allow this. You know, for a tree, the tree's genome is fixed for its lifetime. And its lifetime is like two, three hundred years or more. Mm -hmm. um, so it can't it can't evolutionarily adapt, but uh, a pest, pathogen, or parasite might cycle several times a year, mm -hmm. um, and so they can they can adapt to a plant's defenses. Right, right. So you can think of like the the plant's genome as a, a big giant cog that's turning right. uh, really slowly. Whereas, you know, the genomes of a parasite or a pathogen or a herbivore are these little teeny tiny cogs that are spinning super fast. Yeah. Um, and so they're going to be able to break the tree's defenses. Right. But by maintaining this, this library of compounds in the form of endophytes, mm -hmm. um, you know, one type of insect herbivore um, becomes prominent in one year. This mosaic that um, is, say, the tree will be chewed except for the areas where that one particular endophyte in this compound is. Right. And so they will spread throughout the tree mm -hmm. and the tree will gradually get more resistance conferred mm -hmm. as the endophyte increases in, in number. Yeah, that makes sense. The chemical mosaic hypothesis. That's right. Yes. <laughs> okay. During your undergrad and most of your grad school research, you were looking at endophytes in eastern white pine. Um, so give us a quick rundown of where eastern white pines live and why they are ecologically important. Uh, eastern white pines are found in da, 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 the east, <laughs> no, <laughs> northeastern North America. I think your previous guest, Aaron Muller, talked a nice bit about their habitats. Uh, so, so they're commonly found in all throughout the northeast of Canada down quite a ways into the United States. 
Eastern white pine are ecologically valuable um, as well as economically valuable. You know, the the great deal of the pine furniture, um, pine boards, etc., that you see um, in commercial use are Eastern white pine. And they've always been, so they've always been good for uh, building material, et cetera. Um, right, because they grow really tall and really straight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they can, they can achieve pretty large um, sizes. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So you were looking for a particular fungal species. Um, so what was that fungus? And um, tell us about the odyssey that you undertook in order to um, get a micrograph of the fungus inside of the pine needle. Yeah. So when I started my PhD, I wanted to sort of follow in the footsteps of Johnson and Whitney, who had been my early inspiration for for um, studying conifer and Um It was a paper I encountered when I was an undergrad in which they had like uh, done scanning electron microscopy of endophytes of I believe black spruce. So I envisioned you know that I would split open these pine needles and, and start making micrographs of <laughs> <Right>. all the <laughs> wonderful uh, endophytes in there. Um, I spent three years before I before I found them. You know, because they were high, they were highly localized within the tissues. Um, they only occurred between the epidermis and the hypodermis, so the top two layers of cells of the pine needle. But I did uh, the other things. I did show that I wasn't. I was dealing with a pretty much a community of different fungi, so we were getting quite a lot of different ones. Mm -hmm. And in a pine needle of about ten centimeters in length, you know, you might That's have a couple inches might have 70 different fungi in there. Right. Uh, it's primarily dominated by Lophodermium nitens, mm -hmm. but there are lo lots of different things in there. Okay. So when you finally did get the micrograph of this fungus inside the pine needle, it did not look like what you expected, right? No, it was um, one of the reasons I had a hard time finding it was because I was looking for a typical fungal hyphae. And these were very atypical. Normally, a hypha would be, if you consider, like a pipe. Mm -hmm. So it's like a little straw. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cylindrical. Right. So if you cut it um, and in cross-section, you would just have this little circle. Yeah. The circle. The outer circle being the cell wall and then the inside diameter being composed of cellular material mm -hmm. and organelles. Right. But these were like... Uh, flattened and lobed um, so they they totally did not look like a typical fungal hypha but the shape suggests that they were um, there was a flux of material either a one-way or two-way flux so that because the surface area was greatly increased they were lying above the hypodermis which is a living layer mm -hmm. and could absorb nutrients from it well, at the same time, not actually invading the cells, so which would set off plant alarms and defenses. So it just kind of squooshed itself in between two layers of living plant cells. Right. Well, the epidermis is usually dead in pines, so oh. it's sitting underneath the epidermis, above the hypodermis. Okay, and and because of that increased um, surface area of the fungal hyphae, that suggests that. There's um, the fungus is either taking or nutrients from the plant, or their plant and fungus are exchanging. Right, right. That's cool. Yeah, I'll put um, one of the micrographs in the show notes because it is a really cool looking image, and it <laughs> and it took a long time to get. Okay, so as you were looking for those, um, you found something that nobody else even knew existed, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, tell me about that, because well, that's super cool. First, I want to correct that. I didn't really find them. I noticed them. But the I would say that the discoverer, the person who said, hey, those are something, um, was the lab tech, Lewis Melville, um, who's also co-author on the paper and several others. 
because I saw frequently as I was looking at these embedded cross sections um, of the needles, I noticed cellular debris or cellular cellular material mm. within the stomatal mm-hmm. crypts. Um, pines have sunken stomata. Right, and stomata yeah. are those little pores where right. uh, plants do gas exchange. Right, um, and so they, in pines they have uh, epistomatal chambers mm-hmm. which allow for the plant to breathe without losing so much um, moisture. Right. So there's this little room above the, the stoma, and I often noted that there was cells within that mm-hmm. area, and I just kind of thought that it was um, debris that it accumulated there. But Lou said, you know, I don't think those are fun- fungus. It looks like fungus. And, <laughs> and, you know, when I thought about it, debris can't fall in there because pine stomata are covered with wax layers. Mm-hmm. So they would have had to penetrate there. And so we began to investigate it, and there was indeed... Um, these fungi that live within the stomatal crypts, or they're not crypts, sorry, epistomatal chambers, mm-hmm. and they seem to be adapted to it. They're a specific type of species of fungus, which we got from molecular data, and they didn't attempt to penetrate through the stomata into the inside, mm-hmm. and they didn't go up really much onto the surface of the leaf, um, except where there was wax. Right. So we began to look at it as like a a third habitat. When we think of um, what we call the phylosphere, which is Mm -hmm. the area in, on, and around the the leaf of a plant, Um, you know, we talk about the phyloplane, which is the leaf surface. Mm -hmm. And that's like a really hard place to live because you're exposed to ultraviolet light, extreme dryness. Um, there's not many nutrients there. Extreme cold. Extreme cold, extreme temperature fluctuations. It, right. The endophytic space, which, you know, it would be inside the leaf, is a different habitat. It's full of nutrients. It's warm. Or, well, it's... <laughs> the, warm in yeah. air quotes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a more stable environment. It's, right. There's moisture there. But the plant defends that very vigorously. Mm -hmm. And so you can't just like utilize that space as a microbe. But this epistomal chamber was sort of a bit of both. It had the the shelter, the the nutrients were there because they kind of, there's a little bit of leaching that happens that the plant, the fungus could take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And the plant's not defending it because for the plant, that's its outside. Right. And it's long, but the plant is very aware of what happens around its stomates. Mm-hmm. So, like rust fungi that your other guest talked about mm-hmm. um, penetrate through those stomata. Right. And as soon as they do, the plant's aware of it mm-hmm. um, and, and starts defending itself. But um, we, we extracted many of these the epistomatal fungi, and none of them had attempted to penetrate. Mm. They just formed. So they're just living in like this little ball. cave yeah. that's on the surface of the leaf. Right. right. That's, that's really cool. More recently, you've discovered something that's super like, what the fuck? Um, so what did you find in pinion and ponderosa pine seeds? Yeah, um, within the endophyte community, uh, there's a lot of research now being directed towards seeds and the endophytes that are found in seeds because this is a, you know, these are endophytes are going to affect a plant right from the very beginning of its life. Mm-hmm. And as we realize the, the roles that endophytes can play um, in enhancing plant growth in the agricultural research community, a great deal of interest has come about in looking at um, how can we modify these endophyte communities to um, increase yields without increasing fertilizer or pesticide use, maybe? Or maybe uh, even reducing the amount of water they need. The amount of water, all kinds of things, because we do know now that endophytes can do these things. Mm-hmm. 
So the seed and the seed microbiome is one that's interesting because we can maybe we can apply a microbiome to seeds that we want to be there. So when I was invited to uh, contribute to a chapter in the Seed and Fight book compiled by by uh, Jim White and Verma, Satish Verma, we we just thought, well, let's take a look at the seed microbiome of pine trees and when, so we ground them up and got the DNA out and um, analyzed that and what astounded us was that we were finding not just not the kind of environmental microbes that you would expect to find in there but rather we found that there was some DNA in there from ectomycorrhizal fungi what kind of fungi? <laughs> <laughs> All plants, virtually all plants, you know, in the 80 to 90% range of plants have fungal associates on their roots, which are kind of like endophytes, uh, but we don't call them endophytes because they are not only inside the root of the plant, but also extend out into the soil. And these, for most plants in the wild, these are absolutely essential associations with the fungi. The plant hires the fungus to obtain nutrients from the soil, particularly phosphorus, maybe water. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in return, because the fungus can easily uh, extend um, into the soil more cheaply than the plant can, expending less energy than the plant. Mm -hmm. Um, In exchange for that, the plant can provide the fungus with carbon in the form of sugars which the plant can produce, that's what it does, it both right. synthesizes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you were finding these um, beneficial root-associated fungi that we thought were only found in roots, but you found them on the seeds. Right, so the you know if you walk through a forest, you know one thing you're going to see a lot of is mushrooms, and many of the mushrooms on the forest floor are actually tapped into the roots of the plant. Mm-hmm. They're extracting nutrients from the soil, giving them to the plant. The plant is giving energy in the form of carbon back to the fungus, and the fungus is using it to reproduce. The you know, As far as we knew, before the plants were like encountering these in the soil and forming the associations, the ectomycorrhizal fungi are spread by spores, which come mm-hmm. from the mushrooms, mm-hmm. um, usually. And so that's kind of how the picture that we had. But uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. But we did find the DNA of the, several of these ectomycorrhizal fungi, mushroom-forming fungi, inside seeds yeah. with hard coats on them. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, that's that's really crazy. That was uh, really an unexpected result. Um, right, because you know you you might not be surprised to find that there's fungal DNA inside a seed and bacterial DNA, and you might surmise that they came from the soil. But what we didn't see is those species. Right. So you didn't see the fusarium, the penicillium, the aspergillus. And, yeah, all, the, all those. Mm-hmm. That's what we didn't see. Right. But we did see fungi that are normally found on the roots of plants. That's cool. And um, similar to the Ascophyllum alga, pine trees are completely dependent on mycorrhizal fungi. If they don't get them within the first couple of weeks of life, um, they're toast. Outside of a greenhouse environment. Right, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, so... um, begs the question, you know, uh, is the parent of the seed, which contains an embryo, Mm -hmm. so it it has a baby plant inside it and nutritive tissue, is the parent selecting things it finds in the environment and putting them in the seed, filtering out the ones that are not Filtering out the fusarium and the aspergillus and all those guys and, and keeping those beneficial ones. Right. You know, it always reminds me of like when Krypton was going to explode and um, Superman's parents (laughs) made a little skate pod for him and they put all this stuff in 
you know, like, right. <laughs> and then shot off into space, it which is essentially what a pine tree is doing every right. time it forms a seed. Mm-hmm. It's like, good luck, babies. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, could it be provisioning it? You know, like we do know that some of the microbes that are in the seed help the seed to germinate, help the seed mean to with its early nutrition, things like that. But um, mm-hmm. so this could be a way of dispersing the symbiont with the host and the, the young tree could land in like a lot of pines do their their first place they're landing is mineral soil that's been cleaned out by some disturbance mm-hmm. and uh, so there's not going to be those beneficial fungi there, in the soil maybe not there may not be yeah but in any case it's guaranteed to to have that available to it right from the start that's really neat and so um, we kind of think about, in endophytology, we think about vertical transmission and horizontal transmission. Vertical being like in the grasses where mom plant gives it to baby plant. Or um, horizontal transmission, which is how like um, we spread the flu or COVID or something like from person to person. But this is kind of somewhere in between, right? Like, And so you ca- gave it a different name. Right, yeah, so... What we didn't uh, talk about when we were talking about class three endophytes is that, you know, these are horizontally transmitted. Class three endophytes are horizontally transmitted. So they arrive on the plant via something like a spore. Mm -hmm. And that creates that little localized infection we were talking about. And then we we had talked about the grass infection where the fungus grows into the seed and then um, gets into the next generation that way. But here we're talking about the the fungal symbiont can be go into the seed, mm-hmm. find itself in the new environment, and flourish in that environment with the help of its host plant. The seeds that that plant produces may not contain that particular fungus, but other fungi in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but that fungus could perhaps a spore from that mushroom could travel to another tree and infect its roots and it'd be included in that tree's seed. So we can, if we follow the fungus and the tree host gene lines, Mm -hmm. we see sort of a reticulate pattern, a net-like pattern Mm -hmm. where the fungus is moving in and out of different host lines and the host is carrying different... Mm -hmm. Uh, fungal lines yeah. maybe back and forth so instead of being a straight shot it's mm-hmm. kind of this zigzaggy net yeah that's really it's cool not up and down it's not side to side right that's really cool and another area that needs a lot more research and, and a lot yeah definitely that's a really one of the cool things that i love about um, science and doing research is that you start out to ask one question and you come away with more questions going <laughs> the first question is boring <laughs> right right because <laughs> what you found is like something way more amazing possibly right so class four are root associated fungi but they're not considered to be mycorrhizal why not generally we res- restrict the term mycorrhiza to a root fungus combination in which the fungus is showing a specialized um, absorptive structure structure or anatomy. Mm-hmm. So we have in you know one type of mycorrhizal fungus we have these finger-like projections that uh, protrude into a cell that act as exchange structure for the plant and fungus to exchange chemicals. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the another type we um, have this growth pattern that's very distinctive that is neither root nor fungus, but sort of a combination of both mm-hmm. with the fungus wrapped around a lot of the cells. With the class four endophytes, um, we don't have that. We have, um, there doesn't seem to be any specialized exchange structures. So this could be an evolutionarily more early symbiosis, or it could be, you know, we don't really, don't really know yeah, it seems like when it comes to these class four endophytes, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and there's, it's it's hard to because they're not uh, there's like so they're so taxonomically diverse. There's not you know one family that does this. These are 
it's uh, something that can arise in an environment. It's probably like a convergent evolution mm-hmm, right? Um, where the problems um, or the opportunities uh, make the organism converge on a certain type of uh, lifestyle. These class four endophytes are also called dark septate endophytes. So where, so this kind of gets at that um, convergent evolution thing. So where does the name DSE come from? D- uh, dark septate endoph- yeah. endophyte being DSE. Well, the dark, the dark comes from the fact that they're often melanized. So they're, you can see them there. They're dark. Whereas a lot of fungi have like hyaline or glass like looking hyphae. Mm-hmm. Um, but these are dark brown uh, usually easy to see that comes from the pigment melanin in most cases Um, right and that's the same stuff that that colors our eyes and our hair and our skin and all that stuff right and fungi often use it to defend themselves Uh, these to store various types of chemicals and other things so the dark septate septate part comes from the fact that these have septa or cross walls in them and that distinguishes them from that one type of mycorrhizal the arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi which do not have septa or cross walls Mm -hmm. when you look at a root you can tell visually that these are not mycorrhizal fungi right right yeah so so having melanin is a common thing um, for fungi, having septa is a common thing for fungi. Those are the kind of the distinguishing characteristics. So they can be from kind of any group. There's there's two phyla, two major groupings um, of fungi that form these types of relationships. Right. Okay. So the ecological roles that DSE play are really a mystery. True mycorrhizal fungi, most of the time, they're beneficial to plants. But it seems like DSE, sometimes they're beneficial under certain set of conditions. Sometimes they're not. It depends on what fungi are involved, what plants are involved, environmental conditions, all this stuff. So when we um, try to do these big analyses of what DSE are doing, uh, we come up with the answer of, I don't know. <laughs> Everything and nothing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, but you are right now um, working on some stuff um, with a plant Spartina. Mm-hmm. Um, in shark septate endophytes. So tell us about um, the plant Spartina, where it's found. Spartina is a, a foundation grass species, and it's the it dominates in salt marshes of eastern North America. Mm-hmm. Also in Europe, too, I believe. There's some few species. The importance of salt marshes um, and estuaries is, is well known uh, because of the ecological roles they play in coastal areas and so being the foundation species that characterize the salt marshes that makes spartina itself very important Mm -hmm. for coastal erosion you know uh, ecological services of many different types right right there's probably lots all sorts of fish Mm -hmm. and snails and shit that live in there so the microbiome of spartina is is also going to be pretty important. Right. So your colleagues have uh, noticed that in the intertidal zone, so this is the place where um, as the tide comes in, um, sometimes it's underwater and as the tide goes out, then it's exposed. So in this intertidal region, um, there's some Spartina that grow short and some that grow tall. Right. Close to the the tidal bore where there's underwater most of the time or um, a lot of water most of the time, that's where the tall form is found. And then further up, where the the low tide exposes the soil, um, that's where the short form is found. And so you did some work about the microbiomes um, and found some interesting things with these dark septate endophytes, right? Yeah, so we found that there was different species, or I should say different strains and possibly and species in the tall zone and in the short zone. So although the plant species is the same plant phenotype, the what it looks like is different in the two zones, mm-hmm. and the fungi that are associated with them are also different. So that begs the question, you know, like if the fungi are form, performing a service for the plant, you know, it makes sense that they would be different in the two different zones, and what is that, what are the services that they're providing? Right. You are right now um, in the very beginning stages of doing some experiments about that, right? 
what we're doing is growing the fungi in in liquid culture and then we strain out all the fungus and the cells and everything um, and then we use that culture filtrate to to spray on plants or um, to germinate seeds with and what we're looking for is plant hormonal effects mm -hmm. so we use the fruit fly of plants which is arabidopsis <laughs> um, that's the experiment typical experimental model plant we use that because there's a lot of um, mutants that are hormone deficient and mm -hmm. we can then use that to experiment to see if we can replace that hormone plant by fungal culture filtrate or not right so so you grow these fungi in this like liquidy broth stuff filter out all the cells so everything that's left in that broth after you remove as as fungal pee and poo exactly yeah. <laughs> um and so then um you spray this on the plants and then either the mutants will either grow um differently depending on if there is that particular plant hormone or not right and we we find that um that the the culture filtrate does indeed have effects that are that mimic the effects of applying known plant hormone. So we we apply plant hormone. We don't apply plant hormone, and we apply culture filtrate, and we see those three different responses in those groups. That's really cool. That's so exciting. Um, it's such a simple experiment, but the results are so so clear. And so f fun to see the, the, yeah. the, the fungi yeah. are actually doing something to these little weirdo plants. Yeah. So we have these DSEs and we don't know what they're doing, but they're doing, they're making plant hormones. <laughs> we, so <laughs> they have a reason to do that. Right. Yeah. So that is super cool. So endophytes are such a um, interesting field because there's so much that we don't know. It's a really exciting time to be an endophytologist. Yeah, yeah, it's changed a lot over the years, and really cool stuff's happening now. Yeah. Okay, so I just have uh, two more questions for you. Um, the first one is, what is the fuckiest thing that has ever happened to you while you were in the field, the lab, the greenhouse, um, or otherwise uh, doing research? I guess the fuckiest thing that happened to me was uh, down in Texas. We were, I wasn't even doing endophyte research. I was with a friend of mine. We were looking at endemic algae in in this uh, spring outflow. I think it was by San Marcos. And this is public park. And we were uh, in this little stream and we were, had instruments out and we were measuring the current and the pH and all the um, characteristics of the water. And all around us were like children playing and they're splashing and throwing rocks in the stream and dogs were running through the stream and all that. And the park rangers came and said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're collecting data um, because there's this endemic algae here. And they arrested us and um, took us to the headquarters for the park <laughs> superintendent to grill us. Um, and we were just like collecting data. Meanwhile, all these other people are destroying the stream around us. Um, so I'm not sure what the point of that was, but um, they kept us for a few hours and then let us go. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you're destroying this. And you're like, talk to that dog. <laughs> <laughs> At, and we were like being really careful, uh, you know, like we, we didn't want to disturb it because it's uh, a rare, right. rare alga. And right. So we took these little tiny samples with a razor blade, but mostly we we're just collecting data from the stream. That's crazy. Um, okay, so my last question for you then is, um, is there a scientist that's well known or otherwise that changed how you think about biology or science in general? Yeah, I would have to say Richard Dawkins and the selfish gene and uh, the extended phenotype. All, all, all his works um, changed the way I thought about evolution and how organisms adapt and evolve. Basically, it, it's the closest thing we have right now to a uniform, unifying theory of biology. I think it explains and answers so many of the questions that all us biologists are asking, and it 
does it very succinctly yeah and very elegantly right uh dawkins can oh man he can write <laughs> and he's a great writer yeah, yeah yeah i i think that would be my answer to um the selfish gene really did kind of revolutionize evolution second only to darwin himself i think All right yeah i believe so cool all right well thanks ron well, thank you julia that okay. was great i enjoyed it yeah i had lots of fun Thank you to Dr. Ron Tuckert for being on the show and for creating the music. You can find his music on SoundCloud and his research is on ResearchGate. Links are in the show notes. Next episode will be the fangirliest episode ever. When I started to do research as an undergrad, I read every paper I could get my hands on that was written by Tom Whittem. The way that Tom approached ecosystems was so interesting to me. When I decided to go to grad school, I actually met Tom Whittem. It was a very exciting day. And then when I started grad school, I read The Selfish Gene and The Extended Phenotype by Richard Dawkins, and I immediately fell in intellectual love with Richard Dawkins. The way that most people would react to meeting, uh, I don't know, pop culture, um, Will Smith, is he still, he's still a big deal, right? Anyway. That's the way that I would react to meeting Richard Dawkins. So the next episode, I will talk to my undergraduate intellectual hero about my grad school intellectual hero. Calm down, Jules. Calm down. The Cool Ass Nature Shit video for this episode, I will show you how we culture endophytes. So check that out on my YouTube channel, link in the show notes, and be sure to subscribe. If you like Cool Ass Nature Shit videos, you can get more for just five bucks a month on patreon.com slash WTF Biology. In this month's bonus video, I'll take you to one of our common gardens where we start to disentangle nature versus nurture. For each of the episodes, I tell the secret on Patreon and you can access the, that bonus content for just a dollar a month. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and a TikTok at WTF underscore biology. I'll see you on March 17th for a super special WTF biologist episode where I try not to lose my shit talking about Richard Dawkins. 